On July 18, 1984, a 41-year-old man named James Huberty entered the San Isidro Boulevard branch of McDonald's, armed with three firearms and the sole intention of killing as many people as he could. Without warning, Huberty opened fire indiscriminately at the staff and customers inside. He would go on to kill 21 people and seriously wound 19 others. At the time, it was the deadliest mass shooting in US history. Born in Canton, Ohio in 1942, James Huberty was the youngest son of a devoutly religious couple, Earl and Isil Huberty. His childhood doesn't seem to have been a particularly happy one. His mother laughed when he was eight, and young James was devastated by this abandonment. Afflicted with a limp after an early bout of polio, Huberty found socialising awkward. His introverted personality and his funny walk made him the target of bullies throughout his school years. He spent his lonely time practising shooting targets in the backyard. A decidedly average student, he graduated in 1960 and began work as an embalmer in the local funeral home. Although proficient in his work, he ultimately lacked the personality to deal sympathetically with the recently bereaved. In a profession which requires tact and delicacy, he would often try to rush the families out of the funeral parlour as soon as the service was over, pacing up and down behind them and muttering, get out, get out. Unsurprisingly, this behaviour eventually caused him to seek alternative employment. He married Etna Markland in 1965 and they had two daughters, Zelia and Cassandra. Now working as a welder, the Huberty family, on the outside at least, looked to be doing all right. James Huberty was a hard worker and he willingly took overtime and gained promotions. By the mid-1970s, he was earning about $30,000 a year, and that equates to about $140,000 a year in today's money. But the warning signs were already there, clear to see for anyone who knew him. He had a history of domestic violence, and he often hit his daughters, and at least one time he was known to have beaten his wife, Etna. He once threatened the mother of one of his daughter's classmates with a 9mm pistol, and he shot and killed his own dog in front of a neighbour after it scratched his car. A co-worker remembered that Huberty was always talking about shooting someone, and he would often spend his nights down in the basement of his house, firing guns in his homemade shooting range. People felt uncomfortable around him. Neighbours would see him out on his porch, pointing guns at them and then laughing, or sometimes just gazing vacantly into space, a gun resting on his lap. He seemed to be the kind of guy who was making a mental note of every real or perceived slight against him, keeping them all totted up for his big day of reckoning. As Huberty was fond of saying, I believe in paying my debts, good and bad. Huberty began to develop beliefs about the impending breakdown of society and the need to prepare. He became increasingly concerned that the American economy was being deliberately wrecked by corrupt bankers and that the government was working against the average citizen. He began buying supplies for the inevitable apocalypse food and weapons. Lots of weapons. In 1982, the welding plant where Huberty had worked for 13 years closed down and he found himself suddenly unemployed. Shortly afterwards, Huberty was involved in a motorcycle accident which had the unfortunate side effect of leaving his right arm twitching uncontrollably. He wouldn't be working again as a welder anytime soon. Around this time his mental state began to deteriorate. He told his wife that he was now hearing voices in his head urging him to commit suicide. He began to fantasise that he was in fact German, and he'd happily tell people this. In 1983, in search of a cheaper place to live, Huberty sold the family home and relocated to Tijuana, the Mexican town just over the border from San Diego. He left most of the family's possessions behind in storage, but he made sure to take his guns with him. The Tijuana move was a complete failure. Huberty didn't speak any Spanish, and he wasn't able to find work. Within three months, the family was back in the US, moving just across the border to the suburbs of San Diego. They settled in a working-class neighbourhood called San Isidro. Huberty found work, this time as a security guard, but he was sacked after just a couple of months on the job. Becoming increasingly paranoid, 
still hearing voices, and growing more and more irritated with the world around him, Huberty seems to have finally realised that he was losing his mind. He made one final effort to get help, and called the San Isidro Health Centre, asking to urgently see somebody about his mental health issues. He was promised a return call, but in a horrible twist of fate, the receptionist misspelled his name, and nobody ever called him back. Huberty calmly waited five hours by the phone for the return call that never came. Then he watched a movie with his wife, and he went to bed. The next day, July the 18th, in a surprise move, he took the whole family to the zoo. After a quick lunch at North San Diego McDonald's, the family returned home. James Huberty got changed into a dark maroon t-shirt and camouflage pants, and kissed his wife goodbye. He told her he was going hunting, gonna hunt some humans. He grinned, gave her two thumbs up, and left. At just before four in the afternoon, armed with a pistol, pump-action shotgun, a 9mm Uzi and a bag full of ammunition, Huberty entered the San Isidro Boulevard branch of McDonald's. He yelled for everyone to get down on the floor, and then immediately opened fire indiscriminately. What followed was 77 minutes of carnage, the likes of which the residents of San Diego had never witnessed before. Huberty gunned down whole families crouching in terror beneath the tables. He killed the teenage employees. He killed children. He killed anyone he could see. He shot at the windows of the restaurant, and he fired at people outside. Seemingly without a shred of remorse or humanity left in him, Huberty shot an eight-month-old baby in the back at point-blank range. He roamed around the restaurant looking for anyone wounded but that was still alive and if he found anyone, he shot them over and over again, yelling all the time that he'd killed hundreds, and he'd kill hundreds more. Within minutes of the first shots being fired, 911 calls had been made, but police units had mistakenly gone to the McDonald's down by the border, which was about two miles or three and a half kilometres away. Realising their mistake, they turned around and headed back to the correct location, but precious minutes had been lost. The first officer on the scene was patrolman Miguel Rosario. Unsure of what was happening inside, he approached the restaurant on foot, only to be fired on by Huberty. Outgunned and pinned down in the car park, Officer Rosario radioed in Code 10, SWAT needed, followed by Code 11, SEND EVERYONE. Minutes later, the McDonald's was surrounded and cordoned off. SWAT teams took up positions on the perimeter, but the situation was unclear. Were there multiple gunmen inside? Were there hostages inside? The bullock pot windows reflected the daylight. From the outside, it was hard to see anything of the interior. Meanwhile, inside, Huberty had found a portable radio and was playing music while he reloaded his guns and sipped on a coke, occasionally shooting at police and the gathering crowds outside, doing little dances to the music when the mood took him. At one point, he spotted a wounded lady who had opened her eyes. He swore at her, threw a bag of french fries at her, and then shot her again, multiple times. Deciding to explore the rear of the restaurant, Huberty hopped the counter to check the storage rooms in the back. He found a few employees cowering in terror, and he shot them too for good measure. Meanwhile, one wounded customer had managed to get outside, and he informed the police, the gunman is alone, and he's not taking hostages. At last, having been given the green light to take his shot, police sniper Chuck Foster got Huberty in his sights. Without hesitation, he fired one shot from his rifle. Huberty was struck just above the heart, and the bullet went straight through him, killing him instantly. He probably never even felt a thing. James Huberty was dead, the massacre was over. In the course of just over an hour, he had fired off 247 rounds of ammunition, and he'd killed 21 people and wounded 19 others. His oldest victim was 74, the youngest victim just 8 months old. At the time, it was the worst single mass shooting incident in American history. Of all the people caught inside the restaurant when the murder spree began, 
only three escaped unscathed. Traumatised and wounded survivors were being treated at the scene, which was now thronged with crowds of onlookers and news crews. The killings went on to make headlines around the world as people struggled to understand what had happened, what could possibly cause someone to commit a heinous act like this. The image of the 11-year-old boy lying on the pavement outside next to his gold BMX is the picture which came to symbolise the tragedy of the San Isidro massacre. Ever practical, the McDonald's Corporation quickly got to work cleaning up, and within 48 hours, the San Isidro branch had been renovated and was ready to open up again. However, the public outcry at this tactless decision caused a quick reversal. The restaurant was eventually demolished, and the McDonald's Corporation donated $1 million to the San Isidro Survivors Fund. Controversially, the very first payout went to Etna Huberty. Etna Huberty later tried to sue McDonald's and the welding company for whom James had worked for $5 million. She blamed McDonald's use of monosodium glutamate in their chicken nuggets and the toxic fumes from the welding gases as to what were the real reasons behind Huberty's murderous rampage. She lost the case. There's a small memorial on the site today, and every year on the Mexican festival of the Day of the Dead, the shrine is decorated with flowers and candles in memory of the victims of the McDonald's massacre.